variant of the vaccine that was discovered in South Africa and is circulating in several other countries. And we're following closely the evidence that suggests that it's more transmissible, but up to now it doesn't seem to be more virulent. It's also very important to know how it might be preventable by vaccines or not. While it's always important to get access to vaccines, it's now more important than ever with this picture. What we are seeing now globally is not what we had hoped for. So we first, not me first, is the only way to end the pandemic. Vaccine hoarding by countries will only prolong the ordeal and delay recovery for Africa and also for the whole world. It would be deeply unjust if the most vulnerable Africans were forced to wait for vaccines while lower risk population subgroups in wealthier countries are made safe. Only through global solidarity will we end this pandemic and the COVAX facility, which is co-led by CEPI, Gavi and WHO is laying the groundwork for equitable access to the vaccines. In Africa, COVAX is targeting phase delivery of 600 million doses by the end of 2021. And I'm sure we'll be hearing more from Tabani about this. This is based on two doses per person and will cover, is aimed to cover the initial 20% of the population in African countries. An initial 30 million doses are expected, and I say this with some caveats, to start arriving in countries by March. These are intended to prioritize healthcare workers and other high priority groups and then expanding to cover additional vulnerable groups. But in the meantime, we're working very hard on preparing for the delivery and the use of these vaccines that are those vaccines that are most suited to our context and to rolling out strong delivery campaigns. It's often been said that acquiring vaccines is not enough. It's an important first step. Getting the vaccines into the arms of people, vaccinating people is extremely important. We've assessed that regional readiness, looking at different areas to deploy the vaccines is currently at about 42%. So this is a kind of composite estimate looking at different aspects of being prepared to deliver the vaccine. This is an improvement of the starting point of 33% about two months ago, but we still have quite a lot of work to do to reach the desired benchmark of 80%. So we in WHO with our partners in UNICEF and others on the ground are working with countries to develop their national delivery plans, to train healthcare workers, to strengthen health delivery capacities, to engage communities, and to address vaccine hesitancy, and to have a regional regulatory platform to support approval processes. So the step of approving the use of the vaccine in each and every country is very important. And we're supporting our member states to do that collectively. This will speed things up. At the global level, WHO is pushing to get data from vaccine manufacturers so that we can issue emergency use list listings to guide national regulatory approvals. While the COVID-19 vaccines are a game changer, it will take at least until the end of this year and possibly longer to roll them out widely for African populations and communities. So it's very important that we continue to live the COVID-19 new normal. Everyone needs to continue with the personal preventive actions, wearing masks, physical distancing, hand hygiene, along with sustained strong public health capacities to find, test, isolate, and care for cases, and to trace and isolate their contacts. And WHO will continue to support countries in all these areas. So I look forward to our discussions today. And again, thank you so much for having joined us. Indeed, we fast not me fast. Thank you very much, Dr. Moetzi. Now let's hear from Mr. Mohamed Fall the UNICEF Regional Director for Eastern and Southern Africa. Over to you, Mr. Fowl. Thank you so much, uh, Fiona. Um, let me start also by greeting all the general joiners in these important activities. Let me greet also all my colleagues and uh, my sister, um, Dr. Moiti, uh, who kindly invited me um, to join uh, this briefing. Uh, one point just to echo what uh, Dr. Moiti mentioned in the beginning, 
it's not me first, but it's we first. I think we have a moral obligation to look at the equity when we look at uh, the, the, the vaccines, uh, the access to vaccines and not leaving anyone behind. But it is also important that we understand that, as we have been saying from the onset of this pandemic, no one is safe until everyone is safe. Moving and continuing the global uh, um, engagement, uh, continuing um, to promote the solidarity, continuing to promote multilateralism will be an extremely important step um, before we get rid of um, this pandemic. And I think that's why I'm happy that today we are joined by Gavi, we are joined by WHO and UNICEF lend its voice also um, to this initiative. And when we look at also how are we going to support African countries, knowing also that vaccines and immunization is not new to the continent. I could say that even the continent in many regards is much better prepared than any other part of the world to engage in this important uh, undertaking. Back to you, Fiona. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Fall. And to our final speaker, Mr. Tavani Mafosa, the Managing Director, Country Programs, Gavi, the Vaccine Alliance. You have the floor. Thank you very much. Uh, and a happy new year to all of you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Moetti, uh, for the invitation uh, to, uh, to speak today. Uh, uh, indeed, uh, it has been uh, a long uh, 2020. Uh, and uh, so when we uh, look at uh, 2021, uh, I think uh, the spirit is that uh, while the night has been long, uh, dawn is coming. Uh, and when we think about uh, uh, the fact that uh, vaccines have uh, started uh, to be delivered, uh, we are encouraged uh, that uh, uh, indeed uh, they will be delivered uh, for Africa uh, soon enough. Uh, the sense of agency uh, for Africa not being left behind uh, is uh, a, a, an overwhelming burden that uh, all of us carry uh, on a daily basis. Uh, and we very much remember uh, the period of HIV and AIDS uh, when Africa was left behind. And uh, this time, uh, I think the perspective is that uh, never again uh, will Africa need to be left behind uh, uh, too far? Uh, I must also take this opportunity to say that uh, uh, Dr. Moetti spoke about the COVAX facility uh, that is co-led uh, by uh, WHO, uh, CEPI, and Gavi. Uh, this uh, facility has only really been fully functional uh, for three months. Uh, and the progress that we have made uh, up to this point uh, is remarkable. Uh, this has been achieved uh, through uh, our, our joint partnership uh, at a global level for introducing what is a truly a global solution uh, for equitable access. But it has also uh, been achieved uh, with uh, countries uh, making uh, their commitment and making sure that uh, we use uh, the ability uh, for a bargaining uh, and a buying power of a collective. Uh, our goal is to deliver 2 billion doses of safe and effective vaccines uh, in 2021, including 1.3 billion to 92 lower and middle income countries, uh, which we call the Gavi COVAX advanced market uh, commitment uh, countries. Uh, and this uh, is to cover uh, the first 20% uh, as we support Africa uh, to move uh, towards uh, the 60%. Uh, the good thing about the COVAX facility is that it is just the beginning, uh, but uh, it is a program uh, that runs uh, multiple uh, years. We are not yet where we want to be, uh, but I'm happy to say we are on track. Globally, we have secured access to two, 2 billion doses, as I've said. We have raised $6 billion, $6 billion uh, to fund procurement, readiness, and deliver of doses. If we are successful in our fundraising, we could have access to even more doses, bringing the total available to probably 1.785 billion uh, doses uh, for AMC uh, countries, or 27% uh, percent of the population. This may not happen overnight, 
but as much as we wish uh, for it to do. But as uh, Dr. Moeti also pointed out, uh, the readiness uh, by countries uh, is something that uh, we have invested in. We do not want uh, to have an excuse uh, when, the when the vaccines uh, arrive uh, for countries not to be able to roll out. So we see this as a challenge, uh, but one that is not insurmountable uh, if we work together. And in the meantime, uh, it is important that uh, we work together to manage uh, both misinformation and to encourage the right behaviors uh, for making sure that uh, we fight COVID. Uh, I'll return back to you, moderator. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Maposoro. Quite poetic, poetic right there, though the night may be long. Dawn is right here. Now that we've heard from our panelists, it's your time to ask questions our journalists. And to do this, please remember to either raise your hand in the chat function or use the question and answer function in the Zoom application. And also kindly remember that we need to provide a name and the news organization you represent in the Q&A function to be all be identified uh, as, as a reporter in the chat function. We are also joined in the studio by Dr. Richard Mihigo, the WHO Program Area Manager for Immunization and, vac vaccine, and vaccine Preventable Diseases, who will also be answering uh, your questions. Uh, to start with, I'll start with um, Shelligan Peterson from the Namibian. Please go ahead, go live with your question. Peterson, you have the floor. You may need to unmute yourself. Okay, so I'll go ahead and read the question for, from um, Sheligan from the Namibian. How many African countries have confirmed that the South African variant is actually there? And can you please name them? And this I will direct to you, Dr. Moeti. Okay, um, thank you for that question. I mean, so far we know that uh, Botswana, Zambia, and the Gambia have uh, confirmed the presence of this new variant that was initially discovered in South Africa. Um, we are, of course, aware that with the movement of people, and in fact, these, these, this virus has also been found outside of South Africa in other places. Um, it may well be that the virus is circulating in other countries in the sub-region and even further along. So what we are doing as WHO is to have worked with um, a number of laboratories uh, in the region that have the capacity for this gene sequencing. And we have offered the other countries, we've been in touch with the ministries to offer them to ship uh, specimens initially to these laboratories for this quick um, establishment of whether this virus is circulating or not, while we work with them to establish the capacity to carry out this gene sequencing, which will become an increasingly an important part of the surveillance for the virus. Thank you, Dr. Moeti. So I'll have another question still from, uh, from the Namibian. Can you, and the, I'll direct this to Mr. Fahl at UNICEF. Can you kindly tell us how COVID-19 has been affecting pregnant women and mothers with newborn babies and how many have died in Africa and specifically South African as a result of COVID-19? Thank you very much. Um, as I say, um, the pandemic has taken a big toll and a big toll on all the segment of the population, but mostly on children and uh, on pregnant uh, women. Um, on children, you all have seen um, the way the school disruption has been impacted on the continuity of learning in a context where we were already having a learning crisis. But you have seen also how some other hardly fought and gained and has been challenged. If I take the routine immunization for children, I take the treatment of malnutrition, or I take access to IRV for um, uh, prevention of HIV. All these aspects in which we have made progress in the past decade has been threatened given the fact that the access to health services has been um, limited. And I think for antenatal care also, we have seen the same phenomenon. And it's not only in terms of survival, it is also in terms of uh, uh, mental stress. It's also in terms of mental health. 
It's also in terms of further exposure um, to abuse, further exposure to physical and emotional violence as we have recorded. We have seen now in terms of mortality an increase um, in the region, mainly in two, three countries where we have seen much bigger increase um, of uh, over 43,000 uh, um, deaths just in the region and covering the 21 country of Eastern and Southern Africa. Of course, the biggest burden um, being in South Africa. We have seen also how the disease has impacted in terms of survival and stress on the health workers. And we know that to have a continuity of care, to have a continuity of health services, you need also the health workers in their position. You need a continuing um, 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 health services to be provided to pregnant women, to be provided to mothers of young children, to be provided to children in all the areas that I mentioned earlier, which are humanization, treatment of malnutrition, treatment of all the leading uh, um, um, cause of child death um, in the region. We don't have all an exhaustive um, statistic on the impact on those aspects, but it is evident that uh, um, everything that is related to care, to survival and to protection of children has been shaken and has been impacted badly um, in the past nine to 10 months. Now, seeing the new surge, seeing the current situation we are in in the new year, I don't think that threat has gone. That's why moving toward the vaccines, we need also, as Dr. Moiti said, to keep the precautionary measure and make sure that we are still in this situation. Over to you, Nadia. Thank you very much, Mr. Fall. And now we go to a question from Jean Richard from uh, Radio France International. And this goes to you, Mr. Maposa. How many countries in Africa want to produce vaccines themselves? Which vaccine and for how many doses produced per month? To you, Mr. Maposa. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I think that uh, uh, the, the, this is a long-standing question uh, in terms of uh, uh, production of vaccines in Africa. Uh, uh, Dr. Moetti uh, would actually be well placed uh, to respond to some of uh, the conversations that are happening uh, on vaccine production in general. Uh, but uh, maybe let me speak in specific terms. Uh, we are aware that uh, Johnson & Johnson uh, will be producing uh, vaccines. Uh, I'm not sure of the volumes uh, at this stage, uh, but uh, they will be producing from uh, uh, South Africa uh, for the global supply, uh, uh, for part of their global contribution. Okay, thank you. Dr. Moeti, do you have another an, an extra comment to add to this? Um, yes, thank you very much. No, I, I do not have much more specific information to add. I mean, I, I, I do agree very much with uh, Mr. Maposa that that question of um, moving towards regional continental production of vaccines uh, in general has been discussed uh, in African countries uh, very much uh, for quite a while. There's been, uh, I think, progress in terms of the establishment formally now of the African Medicines Agency, which is going to play an important role in supporting this, including the, the regulatory side of things. We do have some countries in North Africa that are able to produce some vaccines, um, but as far as I know, the only uh, potential for production of this COVID-19 vaccine now is what was mentioned by Mr. Posa, by Mr. Maposa. Uh, what I hope coming out of this is that some of these discussions that have arisen in the context of this emergency of a pandemic will be sustained so that investment is made, the partnerships between the governments and the private sector and investors are made. And the next time something like this happened, we do have the capacity and the possibility for more local production of these, of these products, which are so important, both for universal health coverage and in terms of pandemics and outbreaks. All right, so we have another question from uh, RF, RFI from Jean Richard, and I'll ask this to you, Dr. Mihigo. So the question is, is there a possibility to do a quick change to RNA vaccines to adapt them to the variant in South Africa and deploy the vaccine where this variant is found? 
Yes, thank you very much, uh, Fiona, and for the journalists from uh, RFE. Um, before maybe elaborating on the change of the current uh, vaccine, I think uh, early indication are, are clearly showing that uh, the um, uh, existing vaccine will also be uh, effective against some of these new uh, variants. I think uh, um, what is more important for the moment, as uh, has been highlighted by Dr. Moeti, I think is to strengthen the capacity of countries uh, to be able, to, as part of the surveillance, to detect any new uh, uh, variants that may, may, may arise. Um, and if that surveillance is showing that some of these um, uh, emerging new variants cannot be uh, uh, covered by the existing vaccine, uh, the platform using the messenger RNA vaccine could, as uh, uh, journalists said, potentially, potentially be uh, scaled up uh, uh, to cover existing new strains. But for the moment, I think uh, the message I would like to convene is that um, so far we, we have no evidence that uh, um, uh, the current vaccine cannot be covered by the existing uh, vaccine. Over. All right, so next I'll go live to you, Paul Adepjo with The Lancet. Kindly go ahead with your question. Remember to unmute uh, your microphone. Thank you very much. Uh, I have a question on the latest announcement of the US government you know, rejoining the WHO and its participation in COVAX. So I want to ask what is the implication of this announcement for Africa? And uh, what is the latest regarding expanding access to oxygen to reduce COVID-19 deaths in African countries? Thank you. Dr. Moeti? Um, Yes, uh, thank you very much. I, I was I was actually one of the people connected to the WHO executive board uh, session that is currently going on virtually when uh, Dr. Fauci joined uh, this morning and announced the, the, the decision taken by President Biden that uh, the United States is going to rejoin WHO. And he elaborated on several ways in which they are going to re-engage in global health, in multilateral um, systems for global health. Uh, I think this is a very significant development. Um, first of all, uh, the United States is WHO's biggest donor. So the potential impact on the financing of WHO and therefore our work was actually extremely significant after the decision was taken to, to withdraw from WHO. And then secondly, as we've said many times, the importance of this member state, which has a very extensive capacity in public health, in global health, in various institutions that have been working in the multilateral sphere with WHO, with other partners, has been extremely important. So it's important not only for the funding, but also for the engagement of all the institutions, the experts that work in various WHO uh, uh, advisory groups, expert groups, and also work with us as we work with other member states. For the African region, I can say this is very important because the, the US has been one of the biggest partners of supporting some major um, health development actions in Africa. And if we are working with them as a member state of WHO, I believe it facilitates even this bilateral support. They are joining COVAX is also <clears throat> very important because again, it's a signal of uh, a wealthy nation uh, following that principle of uh, equity and global solidarity and contributing in various ways, including financially to support other countries to have access to this, uh, these important tools. So for, for WHO and for global health, I would say this is a, indeed very important and very significant development. Thank you very much, Dr. Moeti. We have a question from Alicia Mihami for our Lord Dr. Africa. It's in French, but I'll ask it in English because I would like you, Mr. Maposta, to answer this question. How do you choose the vaccines that will be distributed via the COVAX? Thank you very much for that question. Uh, the COVAX uh, looks at um, uh, a broad set of uh, vaccines. Uh, and the intention is to uh, understand that there will be attrition. Uh, we will lose some vaccines along the way. Uh, and so we have got to make that pool uh, as broad uh, as is possible. 
Uh, but some of uh, the other things that uh, obviously are, are important, finally, when vaccines get to come out to the public, uh, are efficacy, uh, safety of vaccines, uh, easy of uh, handling, uh, affordability. Uh, so those are some of the parameters uh, that uh, we, we, we look at. Uh, in the context of Africa, uh, we have, uh, as uh, the Vaccine Alliance, uh, invested uh, in, uh, in a lot of cold chain. Uh, and uh, so the question is, can we actually bring vaccines that uh, can leverage uh, the infrastructure that uh, already exists, uh, but also working with countries a specific example here would be the countries that have had Ebola, DRC, and other countries that can actually also hang the ultra cold chain because they have hanged it the same for Ebola as well. So it's a broad set of vaccines that in dialogue with countries, countries guide us in terms of what their preference uh, is uh, for their population, but we want to make sure that uh, uh, we we broaden the basket so that there is choice. Uh, as we know, uh, that supply uh, is always or was always going to be constrained. Uh, having a number of choices uh, would help us uh, to actually ramp up uh, faster. Thank you very much. So I'd like to go live now to Dayo Adesulu. Uh, from Nigeria, kindly ask your question. Okay, I'll read out your question, Dayo, and this question is directed to you, Mr. Fall. In Nigeria, the most affected by the coronavirus are the older people. There are little or no cases of affection among children. Does that suggest a high immunity rate among the children? Thank you very much. I'm always happy when I hear the children's issues brought up um, in this kind of conversation. Uh, probably on the level of humanity and the scientific dimension, I will leave it uh, with my colleagues from WHO. But what I wanted to just say is that uh, because of uh, um, the vulnerability of the elderly, I think when we discuss um, the issue of prioritization, they will put um, among the priority group um, together, of course, with the frontline workers and those frontline workers being um, health workers um, at first. Um, this is also something we have widely used and discussed when it came to the issue of school opening. At some point, we say that, yes, children could be affected like the other segment of the population. But if you put on a scale um, the damage that the school disruption was provoking among children compared um, to the public health impact um, the public health impact was minimum and the overweight was coming um, from the damage that the children were facing, both in terms of losing opportunity of learning, but at the same time also some of the issues that I referred to earlier in terms of mental health, in terms of uh, further exposure um, to abuse. Um, one point maybe I wanted to add in relation to children is that because of the national immunization program, that has been rolled out for decades and to which I speak to when I was saying that Africa is used to humanization and probably we could be even better prepared than the rest of the world um, who engage in this mass under massive undertaking. It is in regard to the humanization program for children. How it saved lives in the past decade. Recently in the continent, we celebrate the Africa free um, polio virus uh, um, 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 in the continent, there are some so many achievements with regard to humanization of children, and that makes me confident that those um, um, experience and those lessons that we have learned can be stuck from which we can take and make sure that when we get into this COVAX rollout, we will get it right in the African continent. Maybe just one word to say also and remind um, the UNICEF work in this together with the partner and also that the undertaking, we are already for children procuring over 2 billion doses of vaccines per year. And we think with COVAX, we will be able also to step up our effort. But we know also it's not only a matter of procurement, but it is a matter also helping government to have the right cold chain, to have the right infrastructure for distributing the vaccines until it reaches the arm of the beneficiaries as 
Dr. Moiti was saying earlier. It takes also all the infrastructure that is around uh, managing the syringes that you need for the vaccination, but also how to dispose those. And I think from the children's related program, we have so much learning as UNICEF and as global partners like Gavi, like WHO, that I'm really confident that once we start rolling out this program in the continent, it will be successful. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, now that we have a question from Anuradha Shepard from Times Airspace UK and Aeropolymag, uh, a French one. I would like to ask a question, and this is for you, Dr. Moeti, on the necessity of having a health san or sanitary passport recognized by international health organizations like WHO and the airline, airports and aerospace associations like SCI World, IATA, ICAO, to help these harshly impacted sectors to restart sustainably and to give confidence to passengers. Okay, that, that's a very uh, interesting and important question in, in the context of the, um, if you like, post lockdown uh, push for people to be able to move and travel internationally. And, and these are matters that are being discussed between neighboring countries, among groups of countries in the same sub-regions and also uh, with WHO and uh, IATA and ICAO being involved. I mean, what is happening now is that many countries are requiring people be tested as they leave to go, to go and enter into the country. And there are differing protocols for requiring that people should come um, and be tested when they arrive. However, I, I would think that in most cases now, when you are going to travel internationally, you need to have a negative test, whether this will go to the extent of requiring um, a health passport or not is something that will need to be considered. I mean, we need to, to understand also uh, the, the duration of the immunity that is conferred by this, uh, by, by, the, by, the, by, the, by either the vaccination and which is something that we don't know yet. And also if you have been tested and have a negative test, you are negative for how long? I think all of this is something that needs to be studied, to be monitored for a, a type of vaccine like this one. For now, uh, in terms of the long term, we only have uh, the requirement uh, of uh, a yellow fever vaccine in many countries, which we know confers lifelong immunity. What we are encouraging, though, is that we can use technology to make some of these uh, protocols more efficient um, and also more reliable. There is a lot of discussion about fake certificates of being uh, of being negative for COVID-19. And we believe, and we have, we're talking to governments and also to sub-regional organizations that if all of this is, uh, if you like, uh, put into technology, then it's possible for reliable results to be sent electronically wherever they need to be seen uh, to avoid people carrying a piece of paper, which may be a fake piece of paper, which has been a, a problem up to now. But certainly there's something that will need to be considered as we are really pushing for opening up of uh, economies, people being able to move around internationally as the, the vaccines are being rolled out. All right, uh, let's continue now. We go to live to Falila Badamasi, I'm sorry if I pronounce your name wrong, from France Info, Info Africa. Kindly go live with your question. Okay, uh, do you hear me? Yes, we do. Yes. Um, hello, everybody. I will ask my question in French. Please so go my, ahead. Okay. It's about the. Um, uh, we, we read and I've read recently in Reuters that the vaccines would be available for the African countries between three and ten dollars, according to a document that has been given by the British Britannique auprès de l'Union Africaine. Il semble euh, que les pays africains vont préférer un vaccin qui est moins cher, celui d'AstraZeneca, qui serait donc à 3 dollars. Et on imagine aussi que du fait des, de, la, de la facilité de conservation du, du vaccin et du fait qu'il ait été testé en Afrique du Sud, il aura peut-être la, la préférence des, des pays africains et peut-être de, 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 du Bureau Afrique pour, pour l'OMS. Je voulais juste savoir si vous pensez éventuellement vous concentrer sur ce vaccin 
pour les pays africains. Ok, merci beaucoup, Paulina. Paulina, I'll give that to you, Dr. Mihigo. Oui, merci beaucoup, uh, uh, Madame Paulina, uh, pour la question. Uh, je pense que le, le, le coût relatif à, à, aux des vaccins que vous avez cités tout à l'heure, entre 3 et 10 dollars, a été, c'est vrai, annoncé par uh, nos collègues de Africa CBC, uh, notamment uh, sur uh, uh, le nouveau uh, supply portal uh, qui, qui vient d'être ouvert pour uh, les doses qui avaient été annoncées par uh, um, uh, Africa CBC. Cependant, il est important de souligner ici que uh, le coût, c'est vrai, est un facteur très, très important uh, dans la politique d'acquisition uh, des vaccins. Mais il est également euh, extrêmement important de regarder euh, d'autres paramètres, euh, tels que l'a souligné euh, notre collègue euh, Tabani Maposa, euh, en termes de euh, sécurité et d'efficience des vaccins. Il est important que nous ne puissions pas seulement euh, penser à un seul candidat vaccin, parce que nous savons que pour le moment, euh, bien que très attractif en termes de, de coûts, en termes de possibilité de stockage au niveau de la chaîne de froid. C'est vrai que le vaccin de, produit par AstraZeneca présente des particularités assez intéressantes pour les programmes nationaux de vaccination. Mais il est également important que nous puissions rester ouverts sur les autres candidats vaccins qui pourraient à terme également non seulement remplir presque les mêmes conditions, mais éventuellement être également à un coût euh, abordable. Donc, euh, je crois qu'en définitive, ce qui est le plus important, euh, c'est de voir euh, les types de produits euh, qui pourraient euh, être facilement introduits dans les pays sans pour autant euh, perturber de manière euh, substantielle euh, le, le programme élargi de vaccination existant, euh, mais également des produits qui peuvent être sur le long terme euh, supportés par les budgets nationaux. Thank you very much, Dr. Mihigo. I would want to hear a comment from Mr. Maposa on the same. Uh, Mr. Maposa, Falila's question was, according to Reuters, which relies on a document from the African Union, the different vaccines will be available between three and $10, the cheapest of them being from AstraZeneca. It is easy to imagine that the cheapest is what Africa will go for. Can we then imagine that African countries and WHO will focus on this vaccine which has conservation advantages and is the only one that has been tested in Africa. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I think uh, uh, Dr. Mihiko uh, really responded uh, to that question uh, comprehensively. But uh, if I were uh, to add anything uh, to emphasize, uh, we cannot afford uh, to have Africa waiting on account uh, of, uh, uh, of price. Uh, if there is a vaccine and it is uh, accessible uh, and it can get to Africa, we need to get it uh, to Africa sooner uh, because uh, the image of the North uh, vaccinating and Africa being left behind uh, is hurting all of us. Uh, we, we want uh, to make sure that uh, life uh, is prioritized uh, above price, uh, but uh, at the same time, uh, we need to think uh, about the long term. Uh, it's a balancing act that we are, uh, that we are playing with here. The, the, the long term goal uh, is to get something that uh, makes sense uh, for Africa. But in the short term, uh, our, our main goal is to make sure that uh, Africa gets vaccines at the earliest possible. Thank you very much. Uh, the next is a question uh, from Maggie Fick Rutas to Dr. Moweti. Today, the Africa CDC said Africa's coronavirus case fatality rate stands at 2.5%, uh, higher than the global level of 2.2%, a trend that is alarming experts. Please, does Dr. Moweti have a comment on why the case fatality rate is increasing on the continent? Um, yes, thank you. Uh, thank you for that comment. I, I think looking back on the, the case fatality rate uh, on the African uh, continent, uh, quite a few months ago, it was averaging around 
2.1% uh, and was lower on average than, than, the, than uh, several other regions. It has gone up, I believe, to about 2.5%. And of course, th this is an, an average. It does not mean that this is happening in all countries. What we are seeing is some of the countries which are most severely affected, that are affected by the, um, by the second wave. So a very large number of cases, and to some extent, challenges in the health system in terms of being able to provide appropriate care where the fertility rate might be going up. This is the, the, the case, I believe, in South Africa. It's also the case in a few other countries, the Central African Republic and others. But on average, we do not believe that the case fertility rate in Africa is so much worse than in other regions. I think we always need to continue, even as we look at a vaccine, to look at the essential care, the quality of the care that is being provided, uh, the, the addressing the many clinical manifestations of this illness, making sure that there is sufficient oxygen. This is starting to be a challenge in some cases and uh, making sure also that people know and access treatment in time. So I, I believe that we need to disaggregate this data and make sure that in those countries where the case fatality rate may be increased, the quality of care, access to care on time is sufficient and we need to continue to learn and to modify the, the platform of, of, of treatment based on the many different clinical manifestations of this uh, disease about which we are continuing to learn every day. All right, and I have the next question for you, Mr. Fal. Uh, from Martin Amrain, um, NZZM Sontag in Switzerland. How can African countries use their experience from other pandemics to handle the COVID-19 pandemic? And which countries do an especially good job in handling the COVID-19 pandemic in your view? Thank you very much. Uh, I think it's a good question. Um, I'm not sure that I'm in a position to run for the moment. Thank you as they have uh, responded to the crisis. We have seen countries um, in the beginning that have responded um, very well and uh, with a limited number of cases and a very controlled transmission in uh, limited clusters. But uh, soon or soon after that, we saw um, a new spike or surge in the number of cases. Uh, what I can say is that um, what helped, I think, the continent, and we did not highlight it very much also and enough, is that uh, Africa throughout its history has been struggling uh, with uh, outbreaks, with uh, diseases. Um, the recent one being Ebola um, in West Africa a few years back, but recently also in different parts of the DRC. And we have seen how, uh, with the support of WHO, support of all the partners, government managed to step up their effort to control and address properly on those diseases. That's what I referred to earlier also when I talked to vaccine preventable diseases. I think a major killer of children a few decades back and on which we have um, experienced and gone through several uh, major uh, um, game. Uh, and I think these are the, the, the elements that for me um, prepare Africa to respond to the COVID. Um, governments, communities, people, are confronted with several diseases that they used to um, go through or they used to address um, mobilizing different segments of society. And I think that's really what is the stake today when it comes to COVID. What kind of lesson can we take from um, the previous um, fight of outbreak um, to bring them into this context? And that's why earlier also I was saying humanization is something we are used to in this part of the world. Um, all the challenge that goes with it, whether it is managing cold chain, um, recently, I think between 2017 and 2020, we counted that over 47,000 refrigerators, including those that are functioning with solar power, was distributed across a number of countries in this region. We know also how to mobilize community, religious leaders, um, um, civil society, to engage in addressing um, rumors that are around vaccines or hesitancy around vaccines. I work in Nigeria and I know what it took to roll out the polio program that led us to this great success that I referred to earlier. Those are elements and also I have referred to the recent uh, um, 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 uh, fight against 
Ebola in number of countries in West Africa, but also in, uh, in DRC more, more recently. Those are elements that I truly believe have prepared the continent for rising up to the challenge that we are facing with the rollout of COVAX. And also this long and established partnership to Gavi, uh, which facilitate easier access to vaccines for countries that are low income, the expertise of WHO, um, UNICEF know-how and experience in procuring but distributing vaccines to the last mile. All of this together, I think, put us in a position where I'm really optimistic that the rollout, despite um, the importance um, undertaking it constitute, would be something that Africa will go through as we have done for other outbreak. Over to you. Indeed, that's quite reassuring, uh, Mr. Fall. So the next one goes to you, Mr. Maposa, and it's from Amadou Kokaba uh, from uh, Sante Joseph and Catre Info. Is there a system defined by WHO to rank African countries in terms of need for COVID vaccine? And if so, what are the priority countries? Thank you very much. Uh, I think that uh, uh, all countries uh, at this particular point, uh, the allocation of uh, COVID vaccine uh, globally has not uh, been based uh, on epidemiology as a driver, uh, but uh, it has been based on this being a pandemic, uh, where if uh, one uh, part is affected, uh, all of us are affected. And so we are looking at Africa in a, in a holistic manner, uh, and uh, yeah, I think that is the spirit uh, of looking at it, that uh, uh, we should not be leaving any islands uh, because uh, as Dr. Moetti spoke, uh, the new variant that we see, uh, if we can imagine that uh, it was different uh, and it was uh, the vaccines were not effective to it, fortunately at this stage, it looks like they may be, but if they were not effective to it and they came, uh, from a country that we deemed as not a priority, uh, we will all uh, be back uh, into another pandemic. Uh, so uh, we need to think uh, as a global community as one uh, and not uh, in, in, in silos uh, at all. Okay, thank you. So the next one is from Bad Kadis uh, from Alo Doctel, uh, Provo Doctel Mihigo. Le directeur général de l'OMS avait laissé entendre que le vaccin à lui seul ne suffirait pas vaincre le coronavirus. Quelle est donc la solution pour vaincre cette pandémie? Les gestes barrières vont-ils devenir énormes? Non, merci, merci beaucoup pour, pour la question. Euh, je pense que euh, cela a été dit à, à plusieurs reprises. Il est vrai que euh, le, le vaccin, la vaccination aura un rôle euh, extrêmement important euh, à jouer pour euh, euh, contrôler cette pandémie. Euh, mais comme euh, ça, ça a été discuté depuis le début euh, de, cette, euh, euh, de ce webinar, nous savons que nous n'aurons pas suffisamment de vaccins euh, à temps euh, pour que tout le monde soit protégé. Euh, ce qui euh, fait que euh, les, les mesures qui ont été préconisées depuis le début de cette pandémie et qui euh, ont été extrêmement euh, efficaces pour contrôler la transmission de la maladie, euh, notamment le port du masque euh, euh, et le port du masque correctement, euh, la, la distanciation sociale, euh, les mesures d'hygiène telles que nous, nous ont été euh, vulgarisées par l'OMS. Ces mesures restent d'actualité pour le moment. Et nous pensons que ces mesures mises en place de manière efficiente, combinées avec une vaccination, pourront effectivement nous aider à contrôler de manière, je dirais, sur le long terme la, 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 la pandémie. Mais tant que nous n'aurons pas encore suffisamment vacciné les gens, il est important de continuer à mettre en œuvre ces différentes mesures qui ont prouvé par ailleurs leur efficacité au début de cette pandémie. Merci beaucoup, Dr. Mihigo. And this next one is for, for you, for Dr. Moetti and, Doc, and, and Mr. Tavani. So it's from Sarah Javing uh, with Devex. 
In an African CDC press conference today, it was said that countries can start to quickly roll out the Pfizer vaccine in urban centers once they become available by buying a handful of deep freezers for each city. Do you agree that African nations could quickly roll out the Pfizer vaccine in urban areas? And how widespread do you think the Pfizer vaccine will be used for the continent? How expensive is each dose of the Pfizer vaccine? I'll start with you, Dr. Moretti. Um, okay, uh, thank you. I, I think uh, what was said is very much in the spirit of what my, my fellow panelists have, have already said that it's important to take every opportunity to use every vaccine where it is feasible and where that vaccine is available to start the process. And with the idea that uh, we will need most probably to use a combination of vaccines in different circumstances where they might be more feasibly delivered. So uh, I think particularly in urban areas where the, the requirements of um, the cold chain or the so-called ultra cold chain might be possible to fulfill more feasible than it would be in, in rural areas. Certainly uh, this, this Pfizer vaccine could be used. At the moment, there is a discussion going on at the global level with uh, some of the wealthier countries to see those that have reserved additional or extra quantities of this vaccine, if they could start to donate some of their quantities, their share of the vaccine to lower income countries. This might well be the occasion then to start the process of planning for the cold chain, Thank for example. Thank you, uh, Mr. Tavani. Sorry? I think Dr. Moeti was still speaking. Uh, Dr. Moeti, back to you. Ah, okay. Yeah, so, so I, I, I mean, I, I think Tabani might, might well add to this, but um, I think we must use every opportunity. Clearly, it will be used, it will be more feasibly used in urban areas. And we, looked, we need to look at every opportunity to look whatever vaccine. Tabani, you might comment on the pricing issue. I'm not aware of that detail. Otherwise, uh, Richard might provide that information. Uh, I see that Richard uh, says he's ready to talk on the price. Um, I think uh, what, what, what I would say here is that, um, yeah, Dr. Moet has uh, uh, articulated it. It is important for us to, to start moving uh, and to start doing something. But uh, while uh, we do the urban centers, uh, we also need to continue to think about uh, equity uh, issues. Uh, even within a country uh, where we don't uh, live uh, a long time period between when the urban population is served uh, and the rural populations are served. Uh, so I think uh, the, the equity agenda must uh, not be forgotten uh, in that process, but uh, we will need to start moving wherever it is possible to move. Okay, thank you very much. As we do wind up uh, our show for today, thank you very much to our dear journalists for listening in to us and for all your questions. We are coming to the end. Now let's turn to our panelists to hear any final messages. A minute for you each, and I'll start with you, Mr. Fall from UNICEF. Thank you so much, uh, Thank you so much, Fiona. Thank you so much uh, to all the colleagues. Um, for uh, this uh, vibrant um, panel discussion. Um, thanks to the journalists for your question. Um, just a few, few key messages. I know um, COVID is a pandemic. It has taken a toll on everyone, but I always remind that the toll that it has taken on children and need always to be kept in mind uh, because it's not only the physical aspect of the impact, it's also the threat on some of the gain we have on child survival and development. It is so moving forward, um, the social economic impact it has and how it can affect children. I just wanted maybe to highlight also the notion of equity and solidarity we started with. And it's a pandemic and no one is safe until all of us are safe. And there is no point of thinking that if you cover or you, 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 may, you put some people on a safe conditions and leave, others behind, you are going to address um, these issues. Lastly, an optimistic note also building on experience gain in terms of uh, pro humanization program across the continent, in terms of partnership which have created 
so many facilities that make it easier for low-income countries to access to commodities and goods like vaccines. Um, building on those experiences, Africa can also, in the current context of the rollout of the COVAX, make the difference. And that's that really notion of hope and that notion, that optimistic tone uh, I wanted to end with um, on this uh, press uh, briefing. Back to you, Sia. Thank you very much, Mr. Fal, and it was very good having you on today's uh, press briefing. And to you now, Mr. Maposa from Gavi. Thank you very much. And uh, I always love to use this opportunity uh, to put a plug uh, to our colleagues, uh, uh, the journalists. Uh, thank you for your time here today, uh, for listening and engaging us. Uh, but also thank you to WHO uh, for inviting us. Uh, and the plug that I normally put is, uh, we have a big job ahead of us, uh, the job of rolling out vaccines. Uh, it's a, an unprecedented uh, logistical uh, scale of work uh, that has not been seen uh, in recent times. And uh, with this, uh, the logistics part of it, we can uh, do. Uh, it is the hardware part of it that uh, uh, many of us here are trained uh, and have done many times. But the biggest challenge is the hearts and minds. Uh, and the hearts and minds uh, really is about uh, the level of misinformation uh, and the conspiracy theories uh, that continue to flow amongst our people. Uh, and if the media can help us uh, to really prepare people for receiving uh, the vaccines uh, so that we don't waste time uh, uh, debating a, a lot of misinformation and conspiracy theories, uh, but we get to the job of fighting uh, the pandemic. Uh, I, I think uh, that's, a, that's, a, that's an important thing uh, to look at and to think about. Uh, and where I began is where I end. Uh, weeping may endure for the night, uh, but uh, the morning is coming. Uh, and I will say again, uh, it may have been a dark 2020, uh, but 2021 is dawn. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much again, Mr. Maposa, with your prophecy and, uh, and, and poetic words. So finally to you, Dr. Moeti, but there's a burning question for you that, uh, that Kara Anna would want you from the Associated Press would want you to also mention in your final remarks. Uh, Dr. Moeti, does the, has the WHO asked uh, this uh, Biden administration to share United States excess vaccine doses with African countries? And what has been the response? Um, okay, thank you. Um, I, I, I think that, uh, you know, the, first of all, the, 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 the US government was not part of the COVAX initially. So I do not believe that those types of conversations were going on. And uh, so far, you know, the, the government announced this morning that it was rejoining WHO. I think it's early days for that sort of discussion to happen. I'm certain that in the process of continuing to mobilize uh, donations at the global level, certainly these types of discussions uh, will be taking place. I think ju just to end as well, uh, I'd, I'd like to somewhat follow on, on what my two uh, co-panelists have said that, you know, the situation is challenging at the moment, especially as relates to the question of equity. And as we see people on our continent watching uh, people in other places start to get vaccinated. And, and this can be hurtful. It can engender anger and feelings of being as usual left behind. What I would like to say is that first, we are not giving up on uh, global solidarity. We're not giving up on the question of working for this equity in the discussions going on with various, case, with various countries. And then secondly, let's use this as an opportunity to really strengthen our preparing for when the vaccine arrives to be ready to deliver really strong campaigns, programs, so that it works well, it works efficiently, and we very quickly roll out the, the campaigns and cover all the people that we are aiming to cover it at, at the times that it is planned to do. And then finally, I'd like to add my own voice around the communication by our journalists. So while we continue to uh, deplore and uh, be sorry about the fact that we are behind 
please let's not plunge people into a state of despair. This is coming. The, the delay is a matter of some weeks or months. And if it helps us to be better prepared to roll out strongly, let's prepare people to play their role to receive the vaccine and most importantly, to continue with those uh, hygiene measures and preventive preventive measures that will continue to be so important for a while. Thank you. And thank you again for having joined us. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to you, our panelists, and thanks for doing justice to the questions from uh, the journalists. And once again, dear journalists, we thank you for joining us and we don't take it for granted and see you next Thursday at the next press briefing. And thank you to Dr. Mihigo for joining us for this press briefing. Thank you very much. Thank you, over and out. <laughs>